brought your Bible today or tablet or iPod, whatever it is you use to study the scriptures, let's raise that up high and make our weekly declaration together. This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, Amen and Amen. Well, a couple of uh, weeks ago, we began a new study out of the book of Second Peter. And I mentioned that these words that Peter pens are his last written words to the body of Christ. And so we should take special attention to these words because usually the last words that a person speaks are uh, very, very important to that person and therefore should be important to us if we respect the person who is speaking those words. And we saw as we opened up in 2 Peter chapter 1 that Peter shared with us some things in regard to the early church, and that is the early church had a familiar faith. In other words, it, it was uh, uh, one faith versus many faiths, and we saw that this one faith was also very precious. That was, it was It's really immeasurable uh, to us, and, and therefore uh, worth more than we could ever possibly imagine. We then saw that Peter talked about how the early church had a focused faith, and the focus of their faith was on the person of Jesus Christ, who Peter refers to as our God and Savior. And then the third thing that Peter pointed out in regard to the early church is that it also was a foundational faith, meaning that it was founded up, uh, upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, and not our own righteousness, not the righteousness of men. And so Peter, he shares these truths in light of the intense time of persecution that was taking place under the rule of Nero. We, we need to understand that this was a time that Christians were being beaten, they were being imprisoned. Some were being burned alive at the stake. Others were uh, thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. And, and so th this is a very uh, difficult time of trial and tribulation that was taking place. And Peter is writing to these people and he's saying to them, make sure that you hold on to your faith. A faith that is precious. A faith that is immeasurable. Make sure that you, you remain on a focus on Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, and make sure that you're trusting in His righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, and not your own. And then we saw last week that Peter goes on to talk about the importance of having a true knowledge of God. It's one thing to have knowledge about God, but it's an entirely different thing to have a true knowledge about God. And so it is important that we believe what is true. It's important that we believe the right things about God. And this thought is really one of the major themes in Peter's second epistle. Matter of fact, we're going to look at the word knowledge again this morning, and it's spread all throughout the, the three uh, chapters of his second epistle. Now, 
today we're going to pick up in verse 4 and we're going to see uh, Peter highlight for us that the early church also was encouraged to have a fruitful faith. A fruitful faith. And so not only a familiar faith, the same kind, not only a focused faith, not only a foundational faith, <laughs> but also a fruitful faith. And why don't we just... Uh, for retrospect, pick up in verse 1, and we'll uh, read through to verse 4. It says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, it's a familiar faith, by the righteousness of God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Verse 4, For by these He granted to us His precious and magnificent promises. Now, I, I want to stop right here, and I want you to notice that in verse 3, uh, Peter mentions Jesus' divine power. In verse 4, he mentions Jesus' uh, divine nature. And so, Jesus' divine power and His divine nature, notice, have given birth to divine promises. God's promises, which are building blocks that we should stand upon and that really take us higher into the things of God. These are like steps in our relationship with God. And so he talks about these precious and these magnificent promises. And the word promises, it carries with it the idea of things that God assures us of. Again, promises are things that God assures us of. And so the word promises speaks of the assurances of God. And these assurances, Peter says, are both precious and magnificent. Now think about that. There's not a lot of things that are precious in this world. There uh, are not a lot of things that are magnificent. But Peter says one of the things <laughs> that are both, that, are, that is both precious and magnificent, are the promises of God. Are God's assurances that He has given to each and every one of us. Now, it's important to understand why does God give us these promises? Why does God give us these assurances? Again, verse 4, For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises. Here it is. Why? So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And so, why does God give us assurances? Why does He give us these promises? Well, Peter tells us it's because He wants us to become, by believing and receiving these promises, you see, He wants us to become partakers of His nature, and as a result, escape the corruption that is in the world. And so, what Peter is sharing with us here is at the point of our salvation, at the point of us being born again, God does something miraculous and precious. God, listen, He changes our nature. And we, uh, we need to understand that we used to be controlled by our sin nature. But now, as Christians, God has bestowed upon us His nature that will now enable us to share in that nature, and therefore it transforms us into His likeness. And Peter goes on in verse 5, and he says, Now for this very 
reason. Or uh, another way to put this is in light of this. In light of what I have just shared in the first four verses, and specifically in regard to the precious and magnificent promises of God and His divine power and His divine nature, in light of this, Peter goes on to share, and we're going to read these in a moment, eight virtues that should be evident in the life of of the believer. And it's interesting to me that Paul, he, he uh, talked about nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit when he wrote to uh, the Galatian believers in his epistle to the Galatians. And so Peter is complimenting Paul's instruction with sharing eight virtues regarding the divine nature of God and the divine power of God. And, and some of these virtues that Peter mentions are also mentioned by Paul in his list of the fruit of the Spirit. And so, as a springboard, though, to this, before he mentions the eight virtues, Peter says, notice, to be sure to pursue, to pursue these things with diligence. Verse 6, excuse me, in uh, verse 5, now for this reason also, applying all diligence. And so notice he didn't just say diligence, he says all diligence. And we see in this that as believers, listen, we should give Jesus our all. All diligence. Give him our all. And we see this. That, that, that as believers, Peter is saying, guys, do, do not hold back in regard to these things. And, and the word diligence, it talks about actually pressing into something, leaning into to something, and it indicates speed and haste and earnestness and zeal. And the idea is that Peter is exhorting us to run hard after God, all diligence. He's saying to us, guys, don't lollygag. Don't be casual about this, but instead demonstrate zeal and earnestness as you press in to God. Guys, listen, just like Jesus gave us his all, just like he pursues and he runs after us, do the same thing. Peter says, be diligent. And then he goes on and he lists these eight things that we should be diligent in regard to. Notice he says... Now, for this very reason also, apply all diligence where? In your faith. In your faith. And so faith is the first virtue. Faith is the first building block. Faith is the first step that we take in our relationship with God. And this word faith, it speaks of a, confident, of a confidence of certain divine truths. And it reflects a person, get this, who has been fully persuaded about something. And so what Peter is sharing with his readers and what he's sharing with us is he's saying, have a confident faith. Be fully persuaded about what you believe. And of course, this is necessary during times of intense trial or tribulation, which Peter's readers were experiencing at this time. He, he's saying to these guys in this difficult challenging time. He's saying to them, have a faith that, that is not weak or wavering, but rather one that is strong and steadfast and make sure that you're diligent when it comes to your faith. He then goes on and he shares the second building block, the second step. He says to them, he says, 
in your diligence, your faith, supplying moral excellence. Moral excellence. Now, some of your translations use the word virtue. And so what Peter is talking about here is a virtuous life. In other words, we need to be controlled by the virtues of God, not the vices of man. And so he speaks of moral excellence, and this speaks of a lifestyle that is pleasing to God in all aspects. It, it represents also a life that is marked by a spirit of excellence. Excel in these things. A life, you see, that rises above others regarding the way that we live our lives. And, and so we are to be different from the world. We are to be set apart. We, we are to rise above. And this word, it also speaks of courage and fortitude and resolution. And so Peter's saying to us, guys, live a virtuous life. And this, of course, is very, very much needed if we're going to stand against the culture and the currents of culture that are always changing, that are always shifting. I want you to be diligent. I want you to be steadfast in regard to your faith and in regard to moral excellence. Because even though the morality of the world changes, it does not change with God. He remains steadfast. Jesus said, I am the same today and yesterday and forever. And so, this is a kind of life that stands up and stands out in its desire to please God by the way that we live. We don't blend in to society. And so, we, we've been conquered by a spirit of excellence when, listen, when it comes to the moral choices that we make. And you know, it's sad that most people live to please themselves. But Peter is saying here that the Christian lives to please God, and, and therefore they excel when it comes to morals and, and ethics in this life. He goes on, and he says, And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And so there's that word knowledge again. And this is referring to an experiential knowledge and how we are exhorted to learn how to experience God on a daily basis. And, and we, we've shared that many people know about God, but, but they are not really experiencing Him in the way that God desires. And so Peter, he's exhorting us to experience God in a personal and intimate way. Don't settle for religion. Don't settle for church traditions. Replace those things with relationship with God and learn how to experience Him vibrantly and genuinely on a daily basis. So faith, and add to your faith moral excellence, and add to your moral excellence, he says, knowledge, and add to your knowledge, self-control. Add to your knowledge self-control. Now, another way to define the word self-control is self-government. Be self-governed. And this implies being self-controlled, that we're not being negatively influenced by outside forces that determine how we act, how we believe, how we speak, so forth and so on. And, and this word self-control, it reflects a tempered spirit. A tempered spirit. One that is under control versus out of control. And so what Peter's saying is that self-government should be one of the marks of our Christian faith. None of this, well, well the devil made me do it. Or I, I couldn't help myself nonsense. 
Rather, Peter's saying, learn to bridle your thoughts and emotions. Be the master of your own domain. Control your thoughts, control your behavior, control your speech, control what you watch, control what you listen to. Bringing them all under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 28, if that's not in your notes, I'd encourage you to write that down. Proverbs 25, 28, it says this, Like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. Wow. And so this is the type of uh, picture that Peter is exhorting us to avoid. And this, this verse in the Proverbs 25, 28, it's a picture of literally being overtaken by our enemies. And so he encourages us to walk in self-controlled manner. To, to be self-governed in our actions. And he says, as he continues on in 2 Peter, and add to your self-control perseverance. Perseverance. Now, perseverance is also very vital during times of suffering, isn't it? Some of you have learned that. It's very vital during times of trial and tribulation. We must learn how to persevere and not give up and not give in. And this word perseverance, it speaks of patience in the life of the believer. And specifically, it speaks of having an enduring spirit in the midst of circumstances. And it specifically carries with it the idea of long-suffering, especially when it comes to relationships. I want to say that again. It specifically is speaking of long-suffering when it comes to relationships. And oh, how easy it is for us to give up on people, to just discard them, to just write them off. And I'm sure we've all done it at one time or another. But Peter is saying, don't stop believing in people, <laughs> even if they blow it, even if they disappoint you. Show the same patience with them that God has shown to you. So we see in these stepping stones, these stairs, <laughs> that, that, that Peter is challenging us to go higher. I, I want you to add to your faith moral excellence. And I want you to add to your moral excellence knowledge. In other words, I, I want you to be experiencing God. This isn't your own self. This is God in you that enables you. To live a self-controlled life, he goes on to say. I, I, I want you to add perseverance. And then he goes on and says, and in your perseverance, verse 6, godliness. Godliness. Oh, how we live in such a God-forsaken <laughs> culture. We live in a godless society in large part. And it's growing, and it's increasing, it's being more aggressive, it's becoming more violent, and it's becoming more and more and more clear. There are people that do not want God as a part of this nation. And they're doing everything they can to strike Him out, to remove Him from the life of this country. And of course, that's always been the case. There have always been the godless. And this is the same word that is used in verse 3, and it speaks of a lifestyle of worship. It's a lifestyle of worship. In other words, the way we live should be an act, an attitude of worship towards God. So everything we do 
should reflect His life, His nature, His character, His divine power. And Peter continues to add to this list. And he says, and in your godliness, verse 7, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. And this is where we get the word Philadelphia from. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And so kindness is a virtue that should freely flow in the kingdom of God. And so that means we should be speaking kind words. We, we should be doing kind acts. We should have kind intentions, meaning that we should plant or sow seeds of kindness wherever we go and whatever we do. You see, kindness is a universal language that is understood by all. And I really love how Mark Twain put this. Mark Twain said this, Kindness is the language that the deaf can hear and that the blind can see. How profound, how powerful, and how true. Kindness is a language that even the deaf can hear and that the blind can see. And today, people, they talk a lot about random acts of kindness, but here, Peter is talking about intentional acts of kindness. Don't let it just be a random thing. When you feel like being kind, you'll be kind. No, let it be an intentional thing. As a matter of fact, don't let kindness just be something that you do. Let it become something that you are. Let it be something that you are. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. You may want to write this down. It says, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your life. In other words, make them a very the fabric of your life and who you are. Make sure that kindness is written on the tablet of your heart. And so... He's talking about these, these virtues of faith and moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. And then he ends with the most powerful one of all when he says, <clears throat> and in your brotherly kindness, love. In your brotherly kindness, Love. In other words, I, 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 I want you to, to even kick it up a notch higher here. I, I want you to get to the very top of these stepping stones, these stairs in our relationship with God. And the, the very top that we can reach is when we walk in love one towards another. And it's interesting that when Paul starts... Uh, the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul starts with love, but Peter here ends with love when he mentions these eight virtues. And you know, what I get out of that is that the fact of the matter, please hear this, the fact of the matter is that everything should begin and end in love. Everything should begin or end in love. And this is speaking of God's kind of love. It's speaking of a perfect love, of an unconditional love, of a sacrificial love. One that reflects the very life that Jesus lived and laid down for us. That agape love. And notice in verse 8, <clears throat> Peter goes on and he says, if these qualities or, or if these supplements, 
If these virtues are yours and are increasing or, or abounding, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. And so, so he, he's saying, I want you to partake, I want you to eat of these supplements. These vitamins. I have, I have a, a, a good friend. Uh, he came and spoke at the School of Missions this year. And, and Eric's always taking supplements. He's always taking vitamins. After every meal, man, he gets out his pill thing and he has this regiment down. And he just, every day, he's adding these supplements. And he really believes in vitamins and supplements and so forth. And he's done so for as long as I've, I've, I've known him. And so th this is the picture of what Peter's trying to get across here. He's saying there's inf important vitamins, there's important supplements that you need to add to your life. And if these supplements, if these qualities are yours and they're growing, they're increasing, they're abounding, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. And guys, I love this. I love this because so many people in God's kingdom consider themselves useless. I want to say that again. So many of God's people in His kingdom, they consider themselves useless. I have nothing to offer, they think. Or they see themselves as being unfruitful. And I think in large part, when we do this, it is because we're, we're definitely listening to the wrong voices, but we're also looking for or looking at wrong things. And Peter is telling us, if you want to bear fruit, this is how... You do it. You do it by partaking in God's divine power and God's divine nature, which enables you to manifest these qualities or virtues in your life. And these things are fruit bearing. And so if you are diligent, you are fruit bearing. If you walk in faith, you are fruit-bearing. If you demonstrate moral excellence, you are fruit-bearing. If you are experiencing God, you are fruit-bearing. If your life is self-governed, you are fruit-bearing. If you have a persevering, enduring spirit, you are fruit-bearing. If you walk in godliness, you are fruit-bearing. If your life is marked by kindness... You are fruit-bearing. And if you are controlled by the love of God, your life is fruit-bearing. You see, loved ones, these things are evidence that God is active and at work in your life. And so you're not useless to the kingdom of God because God will use all these things for man's good and for His glory. So Peter's saying, guys, keep taking these vitamins every day. Keep taking these supplements every day. Make them become who you are. Digest them. Let them become a part of your spiritual metabolism. But you see, what we need to understand is this. The domain of darkness wants us to believe that we are useless and fruitless. Have you ever felt that way? Let me say it again. The domain of darkness wants us to believe that we are useless and fruitless as Christians. That our lives don't really matter. And guys, I can guarantee you that some people listening to this message, they feel those very things. They feel useless. They feel fruitless. And the enemy loves to belittle us with those lies. And that's what they are. They're lies from the pit 
of hell. You know, in the kingdom of God, there's two contrasts. There are those who think they're all that. They have a special anointing, a special calling. They're special. Well, yeah, everybody's special in the kingdom, but I'm just a little more special. They think so highly of themselves. And they let everyone know about it. And then there's those that are just the opposite. They think so lowly of themselves. They believe, they're convinced that they're the least of the least of the least. They look at themselves and they just say, I'm useless. I'm fruitless. And neither of those attitudes belong in the body of Christ. Neither of those attitudes belong in the kingdom of God. And so, the, the enemy wants us to think that deep down inside that, that, that we're really just useless for him. Why, why even try, right? But Peter is saying here, no! No. If we clothe ourselves with these virtues, these supplements, these vitamins, and they are growing in our lives, they render us neither useless nor unfruitful. And then Peter goes on to say in verse 9, let's read this out loud together, shall we? Let's go to verse 9. <laughs> I guess we don't have verse 9. It says this. It says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgot what Jesus did upon the cross. You see, when we forget what Jesus did upon the cross and what His divine nature and divine power provides for us, we don't see things as they truly are. And of course, when I thought about this, of being blind, of being short-sighted, I thought of Mr. Magoo, right? <laughs> now, when I grew up, I used to watch Mr. Magoo all the time. I don't know if he's still on. Is Mr. Magoo still on TV, grandparents? Because you watch the kids the most. Are, I don't know. Is he, he's no longer in action. Mr. Magoo, man, this guy was a hoot because he was blind as a bat. I mean, he just got by in life by sheer luck as he avoided one disaster after another. And that's what his life... I mean, Mr. Magoo was an accident waiting to happen. And loved ones, when we forget what Jesus did upon the cross, we, we end up just bumbling and stumbling our way through life just like Mr. Magoo. We become short-sighted, and we can't see His precious and magnificent promises. And as a result of uh, that, it makes us to trip up and to trip over the various obstacles that are thrown in front of us. But what Peter is sharing here, what Peter is saying to us this morning is that when we hold fast to the precious and magnificent promises of God, they will steer us away from those accidents that are just waiting to happen. You see, they enable us and they empower us to walk in the virtues of God, thus avoiding the vices of man. And as a result, we become both useful and fruitful in our walk with God. Would you all stand with me and we're going to close in a prayer? <clears throat> I 
And let's pray this prayer out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your divine power and nature that enables us to walk as you walked. May we be diligent in our faith. May we demonstrate moral excellence. May we experience you daily, walking in self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. We ask this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask the prayer team, the elders, to come forward, and we're going to close in a song of, of worship. Now, I just want to encourage you that uh, if the Holy Spirit spoke to you during today's message, if, if there's something that you want to really bring to the altar and bring before God, this would be a great time to do that. Or if you have need of anything else, physical healing, maybe you're in between jobs, maybe there's relationship issues, whatever it is, God cares. He really cares. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too small. They're all the same thing to Him. Now I want to encourage you to, to uh, give those things over. And I want to encourage you this week and in the weeks and months and years to come, make sure you're taking your supplements. Make sure that you're taking your vitamins and that they're becoming a part of who you are. And these things, these qualities, these virtues will take you higher and higher and higher in your relationship with God. And as a result, more impactful in your relationship with man. And should you be here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. He loves you so much. He came and he died on my behalf and on your behalf. He so loved you, he was willing to give up his life for you and for me. So that my sins and your sins could be forgiven. And that we could become partakers of his divine nature, his divine power. And as a result, experience his divine, precious, and magnificent promises. They're only given to those who believe and those who receive. And so if we haven't believed in Jesus, if we haven't received him into our lives, we live outside that scope of the magnificent and precious promises of God. But once we enter into his kingdom, once we're born again, once salvation is ours, he not only bestows upon us his righteousness and forgiveness, he also places his spirit, which gives us a future and a hope. And we can now become like he was, living a virtuous life for the good of man and for the glory of God. We don't do it for our own fame, for our own glory. We do it for the goodness of man and the glory of God. If you've never made that step of faith today, I want to encourage you to do so. I want to encourage you to, to step into the arms of Jesus today and, and just say, I, I'm surrendering. And I receive your magnificent and precious promises that will grant me your divine nature and power. God bless you. God bless you. If you haven't ever made that decision, would you do so today? Would you come and share with one of these people up here at prayer or maybe share with the person next to you? God bless. Back to your fall, I'm
longing for you So come and move Stir up our hearts to seek your face anew Awaken desire to worship you Revive us in your perfect love My king stepped down from his throne Seek your face anew Awaken desire to worship you Revive us in your perfect love Oh, come and move Holy Spirit, be our breakthrough Our one desire is to know you Revive Revive us in your perfect love 
Lord, we thank you that we have all the tools we need. We have the fellowship we need, God, to, to follow you and to spur one another on. I just pray that you would help us to do that, Lord. Help us to love each other. It's by this that the world will know that we're your disciples, Jesus, if we love one another. So, God, I pray that you would help us to do that. Lord, I pray for all the different trials and just hardships in our lives, God. Each of us have something, and it doesn't matter what it is. It's You care about it so much, Lord. So I just thank you, God, that you love us, you care for us, and you care what we're going through. And I pray, Lord, that you would just be our breakthrough. So God, I pray that you would help us to pay attention to you, help us to pay attention to what you're doing, and not get caught up in all the little things, God. I pray that you would just captivate our imaginations. And it's so easy just to be distracted by all the little things in this world. So Jesus, we just thank you for loving us. We thank you for walking with us. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would save this world. We pray that you would bring salvation to all those who don't know you, God, that you would be their savior. You are their savior, God. I pray that they would turn to you us be the light, God. Help us to shine in the darkness and not cover up the light that you've given us, God. So we just thank you. We praise you, Lord. We pray that you go with us as we leave, that you'd bless each and every person here. Pray that our desires would be to know you more and to love you more, God. Just change our desires to make them what you want them to be, God. Pray this in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Have a great week.